Yesterday when I arrived here, Arthur was showing me, um, he actually is just constantly working on wild food here and processing his wild food. And so I walked in and of course he just had things going on and I um, thought I would show you some of that. So right now he's processing hickory nuts and today I got to try an elixir that he makes out of that, a traditional, actually indigenous um, elixir that's made from hickory. So I want to show you that process. And what I want to focus on in this um, interview with him is what food processing really is. When I first met Arthur, my opinion of food processing, when I thought of food processing, I thought of, you know, Kraft macaroni and cheese, processed food, right? Like processed cheese food or something like that. Um, I didn't understand at that time. I had a very utopian idea about nature. And I thought kind of, you know, we could just walk through nature eating food off the trees um, like we would in a hybridized fruit orchard. But in nature, it's a little bit different, and food processing is actually essential to getting nutrition out of an ecosystem. So uh, a person, especially the indigenous people, had very advanced, actually, understanding of how to process their food. Well, these hickory nuts are, um, and I'll let Arthur tell you more, but they're a relative of nuts we use today. Uh, however, the nuts we use today have been hybridized and are much bigger and easier to just pull out big fat kernels of food. With these, it's a little bit different and they need to be processed. And so we're going to show you how to process them. And Arthur's going to tell you a little bit about what food processing really is and why it's essential to anybody who's going to spend time in their eco range harvesting food. All right, Arthur Haynes, good morning. Thanks for taking the time to, uh, to show us a little bit of the food you've been processing at home here. What do we have today, and um, what can you tell us about this food? Well, what we're looking at are pig nut hickory, and these are actually the, the nuts themselves that have been removed from the husk, so there's already been a stage of processing that's gone on from how we would find them in the wild. But pig nut hickory is something that grows sort of the southern half of New England and south down through the, uh, the Appalachians. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful food relative of the pecan that we eat today, same genus. Right, and so when I tasted that, the first thing I, I noticed was that it tasted to me just like pecan tastes. And when we open them up, it, it's very reminiscent of the pecan or the walnut. So that genus, the pecan, the walnut, they're all from the same, same family of plants? They are, that's right. And what do we call that family of plants? Uh, it's actually the walnut family, the Jugland AC. Okay, great. Um, so, so this nut obviously doesn't come right off the tree just like that then. So no. tell me a little bit about what it's like from when we actually get it off the tree. Well, this is an example of one that is just as it falls to the ground. And that has a green husk that has a real resiny fragrance to it when it lands. And once it dries, it is as you see, it dries into this brown husk. Very often they split open into four pieces. This particular one has stayed close, so I'll be soaking it in water and then drying it to let it expand, contract, and split open for me. So okay, so so you soak it in water and then you dry it. And how are you drying these? These, because it's so late in the year now, they're just drying next to the wood stove. Excellent, brilliant. Okay, and so once we actually get the 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 thing dried out and we crack it open, what's next? Well, you can see here, Here's one of the nuts that sit on the inside, and these are the remnants of the husk. Pig nut hickory has a real thin little husk that you can see. It's different from some of the other species. And then we need to get the actual kernel out of that nut. And you can take a look and see it's very much unlike <laughs> the pecan. Right. The actual kernel inside of that is much smaller and much harder to remove. So we use bone or metal picks to help take these things out. The problem is, you know, when you shell a few of these, as you can see here, you get this tiny little amount of very nutrient-dense food, but it's not the same volume that you get with a pecan. So the natives have this way of processing these foods to make sure that they didn't just spend hours and hours and hours shelling these nuts to get a very small amount of food. And what they did is what we're doing here. They literally would just crush in a mortar and pestle the entire nut that you see here, shell and all, and then would boil it in water to extract all of those fats out of it. So it's kind of like making a nut milk instead of a maceration in a blender. Exactly. We're gonna use hot, hot water here. Yep. So the, I wanna show this mortar and pestle that you're working with because you know, I use a mortar and pestle at home in my kitchen. This is a much bigger unit you got here. Um, and obviously you do a lot of, uh, I mean, you must use this thing constantly, eh? Yeah, this is 
this was a gift from a friend, and I don't know how I lived without it. And that, what's the wood this is made of? This is black cherry, so it's a really hard uh, wood that can resist these shell fragments from smashing down into them. Right, and so the size of that, it's, what's interesting to me is a lot of people have, and I've always kind of found it funny some of the mortar and pestles people have at home because they're like little decorative wooden ones and you know they're not being used really. And then there's the ceramic ones that are really designed for pharmaceutical powders or whatever. Uh, but this is, this is uh, really what you'd need if you were going to actually be processing a lot of wild food at home. You'd want something big like this, eh? Yeah, I mean if you just want to, if you just want to shell these to get a small amount to bake into cookies and that, that kind of the, the novelty forager who does it once in a while to make a, a bread or something like that, uh, you don't need anything special. But when you want to do this as uh, a significant part of your life where you're eating wild foods constantly, you, you need some things that are different from the mainstream processing. Tell me, define that thing, that processing for me, because again, I want to give people a, a new understanding of what food processing is and how it's actually something that's beneficial for us, not, not just the negative idea that we have about food processing. I, I use the word pretty loosely, and to me, the processing is what I have to do to the wild food uh, before I eat it. So it's not always a negative. Sometimes it's an absolute necessary. And I mean, there are great examples like take uh, the fruits of oak trees, acorns. I mean, they're loaded with tannic acids that bind with minerals and let those minerals pass unabsorbed from our body. And we have to use water or lye or clays or something to remove those tannins so that we can have that nutritious food. Right, and, and yesterday you showed me the processing of the acorns you're doing here, and I know that for you, wild rice and acorn are some of the staple foods that allow you to yeah. increase the wild food in your diet here. So, um, but the, you told me that the, the flour from the acorn you're processing right now, it's about a 14-day process, isn't it? It is the way I like to do it, which does not have water continually running through it, but rather water is put in a container, allowed to soak on the acorn flour for a while, poured off and more water added to it because I'm not running so much water through it constantly I have to let the water sit for a longer period of time and we just have them going all the time as soon as one stops a new batch is going so that we always have acorn flour available and so and and so if we're going to if we're going to wild forage our own foods we're going to be either we're going to be peeling things or we're going you to bet. be cracking things or husking things and there there are some things that we absolutely have to cook because some of them contain enzymes that actually destroy vitamins in our body and if we don't cook them we actually remove vitamins from our body and when we look at something like these um, hickory nuts here, mm -hmm. how, how, how do they differ from what we're growing today commercially, say the pecan uh, as an example, which is a hybridized um, version of the same family? Well, we certainly, as you can see from a practical standpoint, as m many people would, would be thinking, we have less of this edible component inside each food. But we also know that these foods are much more nutrient dense because they haven't been hybridized to give us this big, big piece of food. And every time we do that, we have a loss of nutrients. We have a loss of phytochemicals that may have presented a slight distasteful you know, feature that, that the European diet is, is very much against and trying to get all of those things out. So we have foods that are high in sweet, fat, and salt. Those are the flavors right. that we <laughs> right. Um, how do the fatty acids change? Dur during the cooking? Uh, I'm curious, like, oh, during, oh. The, during the hybridization, right. does the composition change at all? We, we know uh, that if we use, say, wild rice as an example of the fatty acid composition for this staple grain that we use here, um, the wild rice has a much higher percentage, I mean, it's orders of magnitude higher percentage of omega-3 fatty acids. These are the anti-inflammatory acids that are really good for our body as opposed to the omega-6s, which tend to be much higher in our cultivated foods, um, and those are the pro-inflammatory fatty acids. We need both, but we need enough of the omega-3 to offset the omega-6 that we're not dealing with problems, and that's, and that's an issue with our diet now. We're getting too many omega-6s, not enough omega-3s. Wild foods correct that imbalance.